Epipolar Consistency of X-ray Images. This is a video for the Mikai Educational Challenge 2015. I am André Eichert with the Pattern Recognition Lab at the Friedrich Alexander Universität Erlangen Nuremberg. This video combines two popular topics in medical imaging and computer vision, namely a simple absorption-only model of X-ray physics called the bear lambert law and the epipolar geometry of two pinhole cameras. We will combine the two to identify redundant information in projection images, which gives rise to consistency conditions that apply to any two X-ray images of the same object. We'll need to use Gronda's theorem to account for non-parallel ray geometries. Finally, we'll present two example applications for correcting detector shifts solely based on the consistency between reference images. The bear lambert Law of X-ray Attenuation Consider the following situation, where an X-ray source on the left emits a beam of X-rays that travels on a straight line through space until it is detected in this pixel. If we place an object in the ray path, we observe that the initial X-ray energy is attenuated by the object. The attenuation depends, first, on the path length the ray takes through the object, as well as a material-dependent attenuation coefficient mu. Naturally, as we'll be imaging more complex objects, these material-dependent attenuation constants will change along the ray. Finally, the bear lambert law explains the exponential falloff of the initial energy along the ray. As you can see, X-rays essentially integrate over the absorption coefficients along each ray. Consider the following two images. On the left, you can see the actual X-ray energy that arrives at the detector. For example, in the region of the spine, more energy is blocked by the bones. If we apply a simple transform to the intensities of that image, we arrive at this image. In this case, every pixel encodes an actual line integral of absorption coefficients, and we'll be using this type of image from now on. Epipolar geometry in case of flat panel detector computer tomography. Consider an X-ray imaging setup such as this, for example, of an interventional C-arm with an X-ray source located in the point C0, shown on the left, and a flat panel detector, shown in grey on the right. Observe that the same pinhole camera model applies to both X-ray imaging and photo cameras alike. It can be fully described by a single projection matrix P0, which is a 3x4 matrix up to scale. Projection is then simply described by matrix multiplication of a word point X with the projection matrix P0 to get the pixel coordinates of a image point X0 on the detector. Imagine now that we could observe some feature, perhaps the tip of a bone or a metal implant, in the pixel X0. Although we know that the corresponding word point X must lie somewhere on the back projection ray, which is the line connecting the source position C0 with the pixel X0, we do not know the exact depth of that point. Let us now rotate both detector and source about the patient. We get a new source position C1 and a corresponding detector position. Although we do not know the location of the word point X, we can infer some knowledge about the image point X1 from the geometry. Specifically, we know that X must be on the back projection ray. We can thus forward project all candidates, which is all points on the back projection ray, to the image 1. We then get the line L1 in blue. Since X is located on the back projection ray, X1 must be located on the blue line. We call this line the epipolar line. Observe that the construction is symmetric in 0 and 1. In fact, we might instead start with the image point X1 and get a line L0 on the first detector. In any case, X, C0 and C1 and the epipolar lines are all located on a plane. By intersection of that plane E with the detectors, we get the corresponding epipolar lines. Also note, the epipolar planes for two images form a bundle about the baseline, which is the line connecting the two source positions. Finally, there exists a simple linear relationship between the epipolar lines L0 and L1 and the epipolar plane E, which is simply multiplication of the epipolar lines with the transpose of the corresponding projection matrix. Let us now put the two concepts of simple X-ray absorption and the epipolar geometry together to get epipolar consistency. 
Imagine a Cartesian set of coordinates on the epipolar plane with the x-axis parallel to one of the detectors and the y-axis orthogonal to it. Remember that each pixel on that line is in fact a line integral through the object of the absorption coefficients. Suppose for a moment that C0 was very far away from the detector. In that case, x-rays would in effect be parallel to one another and orthogonal to the detector. This means that x-rays would be integrating over the y-axis of the Cartesian grid. The crucial observation in this video is now that an integral over the epipolar line is in effect an integral over the epipolar plane because integrating over the epipolar line is in effect integrating over the Cartesian grid's x-axis while the x-rays themselves have already integrated over the y-axis. Due to symmetry we can compute the plane integral over the epipolar plane from either of the two corresponding epipolar lines. This means we have two ways of computing the same quantity from either image. The information on epipolar lines of the x-ray images is redundant. However, the assumption that x-rays are parallel to one another is not valid in case of a medical C-arm. And also, we implicitly assumed that the object is fully visible on the detector because the line integrals on the detector are finite and thus the plane integral is only the same as the line integrals if the object is restricted to this little diamond shape. Let us first address the first assumption and the error that we make by assuming that rays are parallel to one another. Instead of a clean mathematical derivation we only have time to present the rough idea in this video. For simplicity observe that on the epipolar plane the relationship between cone beam and parallel beam geometries is actually a coordinate transform from Cartesian to polar coordinates up to some cosine weights. We will denote the plane integral of the plane E by the 3D radon transform rho f. This is really just a fancy name for plane integral over the plane E. We can express this plane integral using the Cartesian grid and assume that we're in the z equal to 1 plane, we can simply integrate over the x and y axes separately. We can now apply a coordinate transform to polar coordinates, where phi is an angle selecting a single ray out of this bundle, and r is the distance to the source position. X-rays would be integrating over r, while integrating over the epipolar line is basically integrating over phi. We can now see that the relationship between the actual plane integral is a weighting by the Jacobi determinant J phi, which has been introduced by the coordinate transform. It so happens that in case of polar transforms, J phi is equal to R, which means that the error that we make by assuming parallel geometry is exactly a weighting by the distance to the source. Fortunately, there exists a theorem from CT reconstruction which addresses exactly this situation. The idea behind Grandjean's theorem is that we can make the same mistake twice, only in different directions. Consider, we took a derivative in a direction orthogonal to the epipolar plane. It would be related to a derivative in orthogonal direction to the epipolar line, again, by a polar transform only this case in an orthogonal plane. The Jacobi determinant then introduces a weight with a distance to the source, as before. However, this time, because we're taking a derivative instead of an integral, one over the distance to the source, in effect cancelling out the weighting that we got from integrating or in the other direction. This brings us to the theorem itself, which states the derivative of the 3D radon transform in direction orthogonal to the epipolar plane is approximately related to the derivative of the 2D radon transform in orthogonal direction of the corresponding epipolar lines. In this equation we've used the letter n to denote the distance of the plane E to the world origin. Again we use rho f to denote plane integral. It's also called the 3D Radon Transform. We've also used the letter T to denote the orthogonal distance of the line L to the image origin and we've used rho i to denote the 2D Radon Transform 
which is saying line integral. Using a simple linear relationship between the epipolar plane and the epipolar lines, we can in effect express consistency conditions for all epipolar planes. We know that there is a bundle of such planes about the baseline B. We can thus start rotating the whole plane and get the following. You can see that for every plane there is a pair of corresponding epipolar lines. Finally, we would like to formulate a consistency metric which expresses the consistency between two X-ray images in a single number. To get this number, we integrate over all epipolar planes, parametrized by a single angle kappa, which is the angle about the baseline. We integrate over the redundant information from image 0 minus the redundant information from image 1 squared and we would get a number that is hopefully close to 0. It is not exactly 0 due to model and measurement errors. We will now apply what we have observed to two sets of example images. The first is a calibration phantom which is a plastic cylinder with metal beads embedded into it. We take two images at about a 90 degree angle. We can then extract the epipolar geometry, get the baseline and get the epipolar lines in the first image. We then integrate in the direction of the epipolar lines and take the derivative in the orthogonal direction. We get the following signal. We can then do the same thing for the other view. We get the green signal. You can see that the signals are correlating well. However, if you look closely, there is some inconsistency between the two. In fact, we could improve consistency by shifting the blue detector up just a little bit. We will now use a more sophisticated phantom and more views. Consider the following situation where we have the red and green views given with exact geometry and we're not exactly sure about the black view. For example, it may have been affected by motion. Let's look at the scene from detector zero. And we use a simple pumpkin phantom which looks under x-ray something like this. The reference images are the following. In the red view you can even see some of the table on which the pumpkin has been resting. We can then extract the epipolar geometry. Note that the direction of the epipolar lines is related to the projection of the source positions to view zero. We can then extract the epipolar lines from the other images. In this plot you can see the redundant information of view 0 and 1. Obviously they correlate well. We can then extract the same information from view 0 and 2 and get the following two signals. The consistency metric is then simply taking the sum of squared difference between those two signals. If we plot the consistency metric for detector shifts in direction V and U we get the following plot with the correct alignment in the center. Suppose that you're now shifting the pumpkin up and down. This would be corresponding to the V direction in the plot. You can see that from the correct alignment in the center, the consistency metric increases considerably in both directions. In other words, if we had a misalignment in this direction, we could just minimize the consistency metric and arrive in the center in the correct alignment again. Note, however, that the U direction is less stable in fact, we observe a valley in the cost function. This valley goes back to the direction of the epipolar lines. We're integrating over epipolar lines and they're almost parallel. This means that if we shift the image in direction of those integrals, the value hardly changes. We can observe the same in the other two images. Again, we have the minimum with the correct alignment, the center of the plot. However, we observe a valley except now it's in a different direction. This is so because the direction of the epipolar lines has changed. We simply add up the two plots and we get the following. We would then simply apply a nonlinear optimization technique over the parameters u and v and get an improved estimate of the geometry. This can also be applied to more complex motion parameters. However, the more views, the more information, the more stable the optimization will be. Finally, I would like to thank you for watching and if you're interested to know more, I would like to point you to the following TMI paper which contains exactly the same topics as covered in this video in more detail.